we certainly feel part of the family here and, uh, and are part of the family. And uh, so it's always good to have Miss Lynn, there she is, sitting back there waiting everybody, Miss Lynn, come with me. She's not been able to come the last couple of times, and so it's, it's really good to travel with her. And uh, it's good to see you guys. You know, everybody looks well. Yeah? You gonna be quiet like this all morning? Like, it's gonna be a long morning like this. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that, that uh, I'm realizing more and more and more these days is that we're all on an exodus. That word has become very meaningful to me and very deep to me over the last uh, really couple of years. Um, we're all on a journey from something to something, every single one of us. I mean, if nothing else, we're on a journey from the cradle to the grave, right? I mean, that's an encouraging way to start a message, isn't it? Uh, but but it, it's true. So 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 here here's the deal. If I'll tell you how an exodus works. If you come out of something without going into something new, you've only experienced half an exodus. Don't shout me down. Instance when when God when God brings you out of bondage. He doesn't just set you free into some sort of nebulous, reckless freedom. He brings you into the freedom of sonship. And what that means is like you are, you're free, you're absolutely free, but you are free with direction and purpose and vision. Listen to me. And, and obviously it, it's a vision for his glory, not for ours that he brings us into. God was very faithful to get his people out of Egypt, and then he faithfully continued to get Egypt out of his people. Okay? So, so the confidence and, and the security of the good news of the gospel allows us to eagerly and joyfully cooperate with God as he does the same thing for us, as he gets the Egypt out of us. And all of us have more Egypt in us than we would care to admit or perhaps even are aware of. Are you with me? <clears throat> I remember, remember asking Jack Taylor, whose name is, is known in this house, Jack's been a long time spiritual father and mentor to me, a long time. And I remember one time I was in my early 20s and we we're driving down the road and, and I've been thinking and reading about idols and, you know, and reading the Old Testament a lot about that. And, and I just remember saying to Jack, who we were driving down the road, I said, you know, I said, obviously we don't, you know, we don't have idols on our mantles that we bow down and worship anymore. I said, but what's an idol in our culture? I'll never forget Papa Jack. He said, well, son, an idol is anything you have to check with before you say yes to Jesus. That's good. Yep. I mean, we read about idols in old days, and uh, like we'll, we'll look at briefly here this morning, and we would say, I'd never do that. Right? You're going quiet on me again. Yeah, I mean, we look at that and we say, yeah, I'd, I'd never do that. And, and you probably wouldn't do that, uh, but just be mindful as we look at this account today in, in, in Exodus that an idol can be anything that you look at and in your heart of hearts you think, if I have that, then I'll have meaning and I'll have value and I'll feel significant and I'll be secure. Anything. There are lots of ways to describe that kind of relationship to something or somebody. I think Tim Keller got it right when he said the best way to describe that feeling is worship. You'll remember when the Israelites got in trouble with this in this manner with the golden calf. Everybody remember that story? Yeah. It says in the book of Exodus chapter 32, when the people saw that Moses was delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up! I like that, don't you? <laughs> Up! Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, 
We do not know what has become of him. Now, Moses had gone up on the mountain to be with God to get, to get a, like a download of instructions for the future of this people that was going to be for their good, for their benefit, for their security, to make them into more of a people of God. Uh, and, and so he had gone up and spending time with God for their future. And now they're getting tired of him being gone. They're impatient people. And, and so they say to Aaron, who he had left kind of in charge, get up and do something about this. We don't know where Moses is. Make us something here to worship. Build us something that we can see. We don't know what's happened to Moses, right? So first thing, first thing we know here is the only reason that they considered Moses to be delayed was because they were looking at their watch instead of God's, right? <laughs> they, they were getting antsy. They were getting impatient. They were getting anxious. They wanted to move forward. They wanted to go on with their journey. And, and not knowing how to wait well, they decided to take matters into their own hands. I'm so glad that we have gotten over that temptation in the modern church. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be trouble. So, so Aaron, the guy that Moses had left in charge, he yielded to the pressure from this people and he gave in to them and he gave them what they demanded. Now, if you've known me for 30 minutes, you know that, that I am not a, a doom and gloomer. I'm just not. And you also know that, that I'm not a church basher and you guys aren't church bashers here. I mean, we'd all rather be known as people who are for something than people who are against something. Okay, right? Amen. But that being said, you need to understand that we do live in a time when this same pressure pushes a lot of churches. Give people what they want. It's a vicious cycle. I mean, if, if, if a pastor's goal is to have a large church, well, first of all, I think that's a wrong goal. I think it's a wrong goal. I think it's better to have, you know, the goal of having a healthy church rather than a large church. And if you can have both, that's fine. That's wonderful, nothing, nothing wrong with that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't sacrifice health for growth, okay? But in, in a church culture like we live in in present day America, where, where being successful is measured by size, if churches don't give people what they want, they just don't come. They just don't come. Uh, ju just so you know, just so you know, any time throughout the history of the world when humans have rejected God's ways and decided they know what's best for them, it never ends well. Never. Never the first time. So Aaron took up an offering. That's what you do. Right? So Aaron took up an offering, and the people responded to this offering that Aaron took up by, by giving a bunch of the gold that they had plundered from the Egyptians. And Aaron melted all this gold together and then fashioned it into the statue of probably a young bull. And, and, and people just flipped out. I mean, they were rejoicing, they were happy, they were clapping, they were dancing. Look, everybody, finally we have a God we can see. We have something that we can relate to. Now, at this point in the story, it's important for us to remember that all those these people were now out of Egypt. Egypt was not yet out of them. They were God's people, but they were still being very heavily influenced by the culture that they had been part of for so very long. Are you with me? We still deal with that today, right? We, we just do. Uh, the Apostle Paul dealt with that many times in the early church. I mean, the whole message of, of, uh, uh, to the Corinthians where y'all are acting like who you were, not like who you are, right? So they, they had become his people, but they were still living out of paradigms. They were still living out of things that they had just gotten accustomed to living out of in the culture that they were a part of. So understand and just know as we move forward here that, that becoming a Christian 
and continuing to live the same as you were, only half an exodus. You've yet to, to discover and experience the reason he brought you out of whatever he brought you out of. Because he brought you out of an old way of life to bring you into a new way of life, a brand new life. Now, Aaron here, <laughs> Aaron knew he was on shaky ground. He, he knew he was on thin ice here. And so he, he made this move. He made this move that actually is more dangerous than just outright rejecting God. So he took this golden calf and in front of it, he built an altar to the Lord. You with me? So he just built an altar to the Lord in front of this golden calf. What he did was he, he just blended a little God back into the situation. Right? He said, I know this, this looks bad, but you know, let's, let's blend a little bit of God back in this so, you know, so he'll, be, he'll be happy. And like I said, I mean, none of us would do that. I don't think any of us would build a golden calf you know, and, and bow down in front of it at our houses. I doubt if any of you have some kind of graven image in your living room that you, that you bow down before. But make no mistakes about it. <laughs> All of us have hearts that constantly create idols. Our hearts are just idol factories. We crank them out all the time. And here, here's what I mean by that. I mean, we would all, bow, uh, all uh, nod our heads in agreement, I think, that God is our true and only Savior and provider. All of us would nod our heads in agreement to that. Amen? Yeah, and while we would nod in agreement, we also, we also all get caught looking to personal achievement or financial pr prosperity to give us the joy and peace and fulfillment and security that we need. Our strong temptation is the same. It's to blend God into our own moral goodness. That's a temptation that all of us fight. I think our idolatry is not so much having another God as it is having a minimized God. We don't deny God's greatness. We don't deny God's power. We would never do that. We would not doubt his, listen, we would not doubt God's greatness in our darkest heart, right? We, we, would, we just wouldn't confess that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't say that. But instead, when we start looking to ourselves, we let our view of God diminish. We let our view of God grow small. So it's like having, having a, 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 a souvenir replica of the Empire State Building. Like, yeah, you could put that on your shelf and it looks just, but it's, it's small. Listen to me. When, when we do this, when we do this, we can both unwittingly and unintentionally, God becomes a resource to us to help us reach our agenda. Think about it. Think about it. God becomes a resource to us to help us get what we really want in life. And here's the wonderful thing about God. He is way too loving and way too glorious to allow us to keep that view for very long. He's faithful. He's so faithful, thankfully. He brings seasons and opportunities to us all the time for readjustment. And that's the most loving thing he could do. Really important for us to know really important for us to know that God wanted to rid his people of idols because they were his people, not so they could become his people. Are you, are you listening? God didn't want these people to get rid of their idols so they could become his people. 
He wanted them to get rid of their idols because they were his people. This is the truth of the gospel. And as his people today, we have to give some diligent attention to all the things that vie for affection in our hearts because we all have them. We can all very quickly uh, attach our value and our significance and our worth to things and ideas that fall way short of God's very best for our lives. Even if, or especially if, it's a good thing. If it's a good thing. You know, marriage is a wonderful thing. I've been married to Miss Lynn for nearly 40 years, close to 40 years now. But if I am looking to my marriage to give me ultimate value and worth and significance, what I will do is I'll put demands and expectations on my spouse that she simply can't deliver. That we're just setting ourselves up there. Good jobs. Good jobs are wonderful things to have. But if I put my job in the seat of my ultimate source of security, I'm likely going to end up disappointed. So there's something very specific I want you to see in this, in this story here. Like I said, Moses had, had gone up to the mountain to receive instruction for the future from, from God. And so this extended absence of his created a, a fair amount of anxiety to the impatient people who were waiting in return for his return. And, and like I said, not knowing how to wait well, they took matters into their own hands, which is always a bad idea because waiting, listen to me, waiting is a big part of the Christian life. A big part. And it's important for us to know that because of the gospel, God never delays things out of punishment. God delays things out of wisdom and love. It's not out of punishment. Listen, if you are over anxious for something that God seems to be delaying in your life, that's a strong indicator that it has an unhealthy value in your heart that you're looking for something out of that thing or out of that position that's unhealthy. You're looking to that thing for some sort of false security. That is good truth. Yeah. I'm preaching way better than y'all are amen, and I, I can tell you that right now. Anyway, so, so these people, they got tired of waiting on Moses and they pressured Aaron, like I said, into action. And so he took, took that offering of gold there. He melted it down, made this statue. And the people rejoiced and celebrated uh, with this new visible representation, representation of God. That, and that seemed totally natural to them. As we said, remember, they'd been immersed for a lot of years in a culture where that was totally normal practice. And all the Lord, we've said this several times, I'm going to keep saying it, although the Lord had brought them out of Egypt, he was only beginning the process of bringing Egypt out of them. Important to know. So while Moses was on the mountain, the Lord told him what was going on at the foot of the hill. Here's what your people are doing down there. Interesting, isn't it? Your people. <laughs> Here's what your people are doing down there. And so... Moses, first, he made sure to secure the promise, that the promise remained intact for the people of God before he went down to straighten out this mess. Very Christ-like typology there, shadow of Jesus for sure. And so then Moses, he, he comes down the mountain to, uh, to straighten out this mess. And this is where I like to pick up reading, Exodus 32, 19. Moses comes down the mountain. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it 
took powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. That's bizarre. I mean, that's bizarre. In our, in our culture, we'd say that's perhaps even a bit abusive. Like, who, who are you like, to make me drink, you know? But there are some things you really need to understand about what was happening here. First of all, there is such a thing as righteous anger. New Testament contains an account in it where you guys are probably familiar with where Jesus himself but was, was consumed by it. So obviously, <laughs> anger isn't always sin. You hear me? You see, because anger, think with me, anger in itself is neither good nor bad. Anger in itself is neither good nor bad. It has to be attached to a purpose to be determined, whether it's good or bad. Jesus' anger was controlled. Ours is often uncontrolled. <laughs> right? Jesus' anger was restorative. Ours is often destructive. Jesus' anger was redemptive. Ours is mostly selfish to the core. Just know this. Righteous anger never leads to unrighteous action. Never. I, I personally hate abortion. I hate it with a passion. However, if I let that anger drive me to bomb a planned pregnancy center, I would be sinning. You with me? Okay, so understand that. Secondly, Moses was not punishing the people by making them drink this gold. He was giving them a life illustration. Listen, 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 listen. Because gold, like anger, is neither good nor bad. It's neither good nor bad. It has to be assigned purpose to become one or the other. Now, the problem was, these people had taken something that God had gifted them with for a very specific purpose purpose and they had repurposed the gift they repurposed the gift and so this gift that God had given them that intended to be a good blessing quickly became a bad curse to them instead now, here, here's what I believe that the point was that Moses was trying to drive home with this somewhat unorthodox illustration. See, gold, gold is also a chemically inert material. That, I mean, that means it has, it has no reaction with any other substance, substance that it comes into contact with. Gold is what they call chemically inert. So, think about this. So by grinding it up and putting it in the water and making a people drink it, Moses was demonstrating to them the true value and power of gold apart from its purpose. Moses was saying, drink this. Drink this gold down. What you'll find is that it won't help you and it won't hurt you. It won't do anything. It won't do anything. It won't give you life, and it won't take life from you. It's inert. It has no power. Are you with me? It's not going to do anything. And so, in this sense, 
It, it was intended, as Moses made these people drink this, it was intended as sort of an, an anti-idolatry potion. The point being, the only value that it has to do anything beneficial for you is when it gets connected to its designed, intended purpose. And on that note, just please know this. Everything that you have, everything that you have, especially money that isn't connected to a vision of God's purpose is dangerous. Any money you have that's not connected to a godly vision is dangerous money. Okay, I, I want to take you to a, a similar but, but also totally different scene here. Like, um, like Moses, like Moses, Jesus had realized the trouble we were in. All of our <laughs> carryings on at the foot of the mountain, so to speak. The ways that we have chosen. And so Jesus, too, sort of in a way, came down like Moses to straighten out the mess. And so we find Jesus in this place. And... In, in a matter of hours, a matter of hours, he, as heaven's most precious possession, would be ground to powder on the hill of Golgotha. And, and as he met with his disciples there in the moments before his arrest and his uh, subsequent torture, and crucifixion, he too was offering them an illustration. It's like Moses. But it would prove to be much more than an illustration. <laughs> much more than an illustration. Let, let's consider Matthew 26, starting at verse 26. Now, as they were eating... Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. Drink it all. Drink it all. For this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. L listen, here, here's the thing, y'all. The cup of the Lord is not inert. It has definite power. It has definite life. It has power to help. It has power to hurt. You've got to hear with your gospel ears. This, this is why, precisely why, Paul gave the warning to the Corinthian church that he did. That's why he gave them the warning as they, as they approached the table in an unworthy manner. Now, now you've got to hear me here. It wasn't the fact that they had sin in their lives that made them unworthy. You've got to let that sink in. It was not the fact that they had sin in their lives that made them unworthy. It was the fact that they had started using the food and wine to greedily feed their own hunger and thirst.
like the Israelites gold, they had assigned a different purpose to this than was intended by God. Are you listening? But, but the, risk, the risk here was, was, was much greater than merely drinking powerless gold. Because repurposing the Lord's Supper has some very specific reactions. Well, Paul said, that's why many of you are weak and sick and some have died. This is clearly more than an illustration. <laughs> so, if, if we need to be careful to keep communion attached to the purpose God intended for it to have, it'd be really good to know what that purpose was. Would it not? What's the purpose of communion? What's the purpose of coming to the Lord's table? Well, actually, it's still sort of an anti-idolatry potion. Celebrating the Lord's Supper keeps us free from idols. Keeps us free from idols. Not by creating fear and guilt and shame in us. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. It keeps us reminded that Jesus has forgiven us, cleansed us, and empowered us to share his life. Luke's account records it this way. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the purpose of the cup, to remind you of the new covenant. And when you consider the new covenant or the gospel, Guess what happens? Life. Life happens. Your spirit is quickened. That's why Jesus said, do this often. Do this often. You're not doing some kind of a spiritual ritual. You're not doing something that maintains your spirituality, you're not doing anything that earns a point or earns any kind of favor from God. You're reminding yourselves and you're reminding yourselves as a family of our utter and total dependence on the Lord Jesus. And every time that we celebrate communion, when we do it well, when we do it correctly, it's life-giving. It's life-giving. Think about it. When you, when you think about gospel truth, when you talk about gospel truth, when you read about gospel truth, its power is enacted you and life transforms you. And so as a Christian, listen very carefully here, as a Christian, sin should never make you hide from the table. It should make you run to the table. Here, here, here's, here's the good news of the gospel. God, God no longer does business with his children at an altar. He does business with his children at the table. We, however, would prefer an altar. We feel more at home there, offering something, sacrificing something, paying for something, 
bringing something, getting what we deserve out of the deal, being punished a little bit, shamed a little bit, made to feel guilty a little bit, because somehow that makes us feel better about receiving grace as we feel like we have contributed. But the only thing we bring to the table for, to get salvation is the sin that needs it in the first place. If you think it's humbling to come to an altar, try coming to the table. The gospel, the gospel is the good news of a new covenant in which God who is more holy than we can ever imagine, looked upon with compassion this people who are more sinful than we would ever possibly admit. And he sent Jesus into history to establish his kingdom and reconcile people and the world to himself. That's what he has done. Jesus whose love is more extravagant than we can measure, came to sacrificially die for us so that by his death and by his resurrection, we might gain through grace what the Bible defines as new and eternal life. Period. <laughs> and listen, I, I know not because I'm just looking at you, I know because you're all a human. Right? Anybody not? Got a couple question marks, but. Think, think about it. Every single one of us in this room this morning needs a touch of life. A touch of life. We all, all, every one of us need to be reminded that we, think with me, think with me, think with me, hear this. We don't have to trust anything besides Jesus for our salvation. We don't have to look to anything else for our satisfaction. Here's the truth of it. We just don't need idols. We just don't need them. So we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, and Pastor Brian's going to come and lead in that, however you guys do that here in your house. But as, as we prepare, we're going to do what the Bible says. We're going to examine ourselves. And maybe, I, I bet you, as my, my seventh grade English teacher used to tell me all the time, I bet you a dime to a donut that some of you don't know how to rightly examine yourself before you take communion. And you use that time to take inventory of all your sin. I, I, I'm not going to do that this morning. First off, I got to catch a plane at four o'clock. <laughs> I mean, it'd take me at least till then. As we examine ourselves, here, here, let me ask you a couple of questions. Are you viewing this table as a place that you need to be sinless to approach? So this is the time. If you, if you have that in your mind, then this is the time where you repent fast as you can. So somebody won't see that you're not taking communion and wonder. I, I'm just telling you. Does the thought of taking communion, does the, the thought of approaching the table create anxiety in your life because of your failure? I mean, only you can answer this of what goes on in your heart. But here, here's what I'm saying there. If you, if you view this as a place where you have to be sinless to come, 
If you view this as, as, as a, it causes anxiety in you when you go into this wrestling match, should I go, should I not, should I go, oh, Lord, forgive me. But if, if, this, if either one of those things happens inside of you, you have misunderstood the purpose of communion. You've misunderstood the purpose of the Lord's table. God designed this place of examination and remembrance, okay? God designed this as a place of examination and remembrance. Not, not so you could possibly become his people by getting this right, but because you are already his people. God got his people out of Egypt before he got Egypt out of them. He's done the same for us.